first I'm going to correct my name because it's Maria. Uh, but everyone gets that wrong, so no shame. Uh, my presentation is called Designing Information for Growth, uh, and it's a very misleading title, really. Um, I hope that no one was hoping it's gonna, going to be a presentation about how to create some kind of coherent content strategy for a company of over 500 employees, um, because that will not happen. Uh, this, really, this presentation really was inspired by the first Write the Docs, in which there are a lot of fantastic and passionate um, talks from people who are working for small companies and one part of an organization, um, and we're creating fantastic customized, customer-targeted documentation for, for um, really specific groups of people and in, for very specific job functions. And I thought, this is so great. Um, I work in this big, giant enterprise mess of a company that's trying to be a lot of things to a lot of people. Let's, we should talk about that. <laughs> So um, this is really a presentation about confronting complication, um, and it's also about the uh, about audiences and how when you make choice when when you when you are a writer you sort of aspire to the state where there's only one way to write the thing and it's the perfect and targeted and true way to write a thing. But you also struggle with the fact that there are a lot of other ways that you could write the thing depending on circumstances and depending on audiences. You are making a lot of choices when you write. So this talk is in some ways about the choices you make when you write and why as your, com as your information base grows and as your company grows and things get more complicated, your choices get more complicated. Um, and it gives you a little speculative framework for starting to think about some of those complexities. Um, so because I'm an obnoxious recovering academic and I used to be in literature, um, I thought I'd start with this quotation from Shelley. Life like a dome of many colored glass stains the white radiance of eternity. Uh, Shelley's talking about the death of Keats, um, but he's also talking about this aspiration we have to create um, information that's perfect and comprehension comprehensive and beautiful and true and to say exactly what we mean um, and it's um, and it's compromised by the fact that we are human and everyone's different and we all understand and say things differently um, which reminds me of what Marcia said in her talk we're all Abbott and Costello because there's not actually a perfect way to create information and target information um, in fact information is more like a series of choices and battles and commitments. Um, so let's talk about what some of those are. Um, just for fun, I gave, a, I gave a presentation of this talk at Jive where I work um, and uh, my coworker helpfully made me this book of everything that is known about Jive. And we all wish that we could write a book that would contain all the information you could ever want. Um, it would and anyone, anytime you asked a question, you could just open the book and you'd be able to find what you wanted. It would be ser perfectly searchable and it would all be in one format and it would never go out of date, by the way. Um, so let's uh, kiss that idea goodbye because really we have a more complicated situation almost everywhere. Um, and this very uh, complicated thing is a little bit of a map of how people use information at Jive. Um, and it would be different for wherever you work. Uh, but typically your information, it's nice to think of your information just going directly to customers, um, but in fact information gets used in different ways by different departments. So as soon as you amass some information base in your company, um, people really start borrowing your stuff, going to your stuff, using it for various other things. Um, and as you can see here, um, the giant bubble is support because documentation so often supports support and deflecting. If you have a separate documentation department, um, it's supporting support. Obviously, a lot of documentation departments come out of support, but sometimes they come out of marketing. Sometimes they come out of professional services. Sometimes they come out of IT. You don't know where, they're, where you're going to start with your documentation base. Ours is out of engineering, out of software development. Um, but it obviously varies. Um, we are, we're in engineering and we support all these groups in certain different ways and, um, and there's overlap in how they use our stuff, but it does, it's not completely matching all the time. For example, support uses us to deflect calls um, and our hosting engineers 
use our stuff as reference to sort of explain to customers how their, um, how their deploys are going to go. The same with pro services. Here's the install checklist of all the things that we are going to do from you. Let me borrow these outtakes from the docs. Let me send you this topic from the docs to tell you what I'm going to do. Um, you go over to sales and sales says, I have to fill out an RFP. How does that work? Um, so they're cutting and pasting bits of the docs into an RFP for a sale. Um, legal, every time they write a contract, uh, the docs actually are the, the um, implicit contractual statement about how the product works. So they're using them in that very specific way, which is quite different from the way end users or community managers, which are our other big, big audience, are using our documentation. So there's this complex web of slightly of overlapping but slightly different uses of information. And if everyone, if every single one of those departments created all their information for themselves, it would be incredibly expensive. And also there would be a whole lot of duplication and inaccuracy and general cacophony. So you end up with a situation where um, you're dealing with a lot of people's different, a lot of different people's needs, and not just your direct customers' needs. Um, because of the, the different ways people are using stuff. Um, and uh, I came up with a model that I don't think is authoritative in any way. These are just some categories that are a starting point for thinking about all the different ways we use information and how that, and then how does that look? If, you use, if you're thinking about different modes of operation of information um, and directing them to different audiences, how do those how, do the, how does that look? How do you deliver them? How do you structure them? How do you design them? And I'm using design in a super hand-wavy way, so I apologize to any designers in the room. Um, but essentially, as soon as you've picked a paragraph structure, even for your document, you're doing some form of design. You're saying, how does this documentation look and feel, and how do customers get it? How do the users get it? How do they experience it? You're creating some kind of user experience. So. Um, so you need to make those choices knowingly as you go. Um, these categories are not mutually exclusive. I'm sure as soon as you start thinking of examples, you'll go, oh yeah, that example is both. So um, don't worry about that too much. This is sort of a thought experiment in complexifying and thinking about what your options are and thinking about how they benefit some audiences more than other audiences. Um, my examples are pretty software-based. Um, I hope they'll be transferable to other kinds of companies. Um, so here we go. Uh, descriptive documentation. Uh, that answers questions like how does it work? What does it do? Um, what are those things on the screen right now? Uh, how's the product look and feel? And why do I want it? What's the value? Um, those are all kind of descriptive um, questions that descriptive audience documentation attempts to answer. And it can really go all over the place. Um, UI orientation is a really common use, and if you look at this up on the left, it's telling you, here's what this UI is for, and here are the things that you can do with it. So it's outlining what the functionality is, and it not, you know, in a fairly useful way. If you're in the UI, you don't even have to leave to look at it. Um, here are some feature descriptions, which are a super common use that is running off the screen, uh, but you get the idea. It's saying what the product does. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with this form of documentation. Um, and, another, and another big API documentation would be another big example of descriptive documentation because it actually tells you what all the methods and, and so on are in your back end that, you that you can leverage. That's a super, that is a really super good use of, of uh, descriptive documentation. Um, and here are some reasons to do descriptive documentation. It's incredibly useful pre-sales um, to show customers. Um, if you don't have anything on your website that says how the product works um, and what it looks like, uh, then it's hard for customers to get a feel for whether they would actually want to buy your product. It shows a really concrete experience of what it's like to use, um, and it has, can have a lot of value statements. You could put marketing messaging right into your descriptive documentation um, to help people understand why, you, why it's desirable. Um, it can provide really detailed reference information that you can't in any other format. And it lets the kind of user who likes to read ahead, we all know that user, I don't want to touch this until I've already read about it. Um, and I think programmers tend to deny that that user exists, but that user really exists, particularly in a corporate setting 
um, where you might embarrass yourself in front of the whole company if you don't actually, if you actually try out software and do something and anyone finds out. Um, it's easy to make context sensitive. Um, if, you're going UI, if you're going UI field by UI field, for example, then, uh, um, then it's very easy to do context sensitive. And sales, marketing, and legal all make heavy use of this documentation. They think it's super important um, because it gives customers, it's legal to use it for contracts, like I already said, and sales give, gives it to customers um, because it, uh, if you haven't interacted with an RFP, um, it's basically a sort of application form to say, hey, can we sell stuff to you? Here are all the ways that we fit your, your stated needs and uh, fill in all the blanks and tell us that you have all the features that we have said are, are important to have. It's really useful for that. Um, here's some downsides of descriptive documentation. Uh, it's really hard to maintain um, because any time that you're going to describe everything that your application does, you're going to be wrong some of the time because we discontinued that feature or we moved that button. Um, particularly when you're talking about screenshots, uh, it can go stale really fast. Um, and, and honestly, um, your intermediate users who kind of know how to use the product are just going to look at the product to know how to use it. Um, and then they're going to look at it to try to know how to do really hard things. Um, but if you, but if, you know, if you go into Microsoft Word and you get into one of those endless um, descriptions of every menu item, how many of them are going to actually be useful for you? Like what's your effort to pay back on making big lists of field descriptions, it's maybe not so good because um, a lot of that information is really non-urgent. And so once you've described everything that's in your UI, you've created a lot of not that useful information and you've also created a lot of clutter that other people have to that people have to search through in order to find the really good stuff. And you're going to be wrong. The next kind of documentation we'll talk about is defensive. Um, and that answers questions like, oh no, what went wrong? How can I fix this? What problems can I anticipate about, the, about this? And what might make a customer sue us? That would be bad. Let's defend ourselves against that possibility with some nice defensive documentation. Uh, here's a nice one that uh, maybe you saw back in the day. Our page is down. Here's some things to do. Maybe not the most helpful one in a way. Here's a slightly more helpful error message. Error messages are great defensive documentation, right? Because they tell, you, they tell the user exactly what to do in the moment without leaving the product. So here are your instructions for moving forward. Um, here's, a, here's FAQ, also pretty good defensive documentation, maybe a little harder to make it immediate, but we know that these questions have been asked. We know they've been problems before. We suspect they will be problems again. If they're, frequent, if they're really frequently asked, then we think they will be problems again. And so, um, and so we post them on the website, hoping that people will read them before they have the problem. That's why it's defensive. Um, here's a really bad example that used to be in our docs. Um, this is an exercise in futility, really. Um, because if you look at these important notes and restrictions, not only are they very hard to read because they're just a bullet list, but your odds of anyone actually reading these before um, messing up are, sad, are sadly low. Um, this is somewhere in the system requirements, but there's some, but, um, but essentially it's, it's hard to, you have to have a pretty motivated reader to read, to read through all these Things, so they're not very effective as defensive. However, um, well, for example, this prepackaged database is for evaluation purposes and should not be used for production I instances. Guess whether that ever happened? Yeah, that happened even though there was a note in the docs. But if somebody did that and then they couldn't move their data off their evaluation database um, and tried to and said, we're going to sue your company because we lost our data on our evaluation database, then legal would be able to say, look, there's a note in the docs that says that this database is for evaluation purposes only. So um, defense completed. That's why defensive documentation gets there. Um, and here's actually a really nice one. Uh, if you have designers at your disposal with clever ideas and you have access to put things actually in the UI, then um, 
Here they said, I bet you're going to forget your, what your pin is. Here's a little keyboard for you to, to remember what it's like to punch in your, your pin, and then I bet you'll remember it. Because here it is in the UI. So you can do very creative things with defensive documentation. Um, and here's some really good things about it. It's easy to see what's good about defensive documentation, right? Because uh, you actually care about it most of the time. <laughs> if it happens to you in the UI, things like error messages, you go, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty urgent. The product's breaking. I guess, that, I guess that's interesting to me, and I will read this. Um, the content is typically pretty real-world content, because nobody puts defensive content in for very remote eventualities. T typically helps you avoid doing something that you should not do. Um, and uh, it's good for case deflection. It's loved by support and docs, and I should probably say software design because it's something they have a pretty good investment in, is that people have a good experience with the product. Um, but there are some downsides. Uh, often, you're putting a lot of effort into edge cases. Obviously, you don't want things to go badly wrong, but a lot of defensive documentation is about edge cases, and not about here's how you should ideally be using the product, but here's how you should not be. Um, and I know we've talked about this a lot today. We're talking about this in one of the unconference sessions about how um, people really use defensive documentation as a band-aid over not doing defensive development. <laughs> so if you have designed your product so that, uh, so, so that people can, can have these very bad experiences, um, and the only way you can tell them about it is to stick a note in the documentation, you're in a bad state. <laughs> like if, there's a way to, if there's a way to crash your database um, and no one pops up an error message, then that is not so good. So people really need to solve these in the design and testing phase and not in the documentation phase. But I bet that everyone in this room has been asked to stick a note in the docs about some really wacky behavior that customers might uh, need to understand. Um, and, and when that happens to you, it's really hard to decide where to put it. Where's the user going to find that information? Like, I think, I'll read a t I think I'll read the manual and look around for bad things that might happen to me. Um, and also, uh, it's really bad news <laughs> to put this stuff in your docs, right? Here are, all the bad thi here are all the things that are funky in our product. Let me document how, it, how those funky things work <laughs> so you can all... It is, and I, I uh, just lost sound for a minute there. Am I back? Um, so, yes. So, uh, so I once had a coworker in support. Um, support loves defensive documentation on occasion. Um, I had a coworker in support who came to me with a very helpful install guide he had written. Um, and the first two pages of the install guide were the top 20 ways that an installation can fail. Um, and then <laughs> I had to explain to him why we should probably not publish that manual um, because <laughs> sales and marketing would freak the heck out. But I bet it would have been useful. If there really are 20 ways that you've seen installation fail, that's probably not a good idea. Anyway, Band-Aid. Um, procedural, uh, that answers the how do I questions. It also answers what are the key tasks that you're going to do again and again. Um, and it answers what I don't think most of these methods don't answer, which is how are those tasks related to each other? Uh, what do I need to do first? What happens after that? I mean, it, uh, and finally, like, what's the best way? What's the best and approved way to do this? Not just the typical way that, because I think typical tasks are a job of it, but also um, sort of best practices. What would we like you, how would we like you to do this to have a really successful result? Um, and these, as, as you would expect, are the very familiar lists, either with screenshots or without, and they tell you what order to do things. Um, and procedures have a lot of advantages. That's why we write so many of them, right? Does everyone here, most people here write a lot of procedures? I write a lot of procedures. You know, they're really useful, and they're really, you know, and one of the things they're really useful for, which a lot of other forms of documentation don't do well, um, is figuring out how to move between multiple environments or multiple platforms or whatever you can say. Then you need to go open up this other interface and do this other thing. First, you need to run this thing on the command line. And then you need to go over there and open up your UI and verify that 
the thing that you hoped would happen would actually happen. And they're very helpful for that kind of, that kind of navigational um, problem, which you could say is, again, band-aiding the user experience. Um, but often, especially in big enterprise software, you do have a complicated user experience, especially if you're, say, a software admin, and you do have to move around um, between multiple environments. So that's a really helpful and powerful thing that they do. Um, and then a really big thing, a really uh, big and good thing that, um, that writing procedures does is that writing procedures tests the product while you're writing them um, and adds a lot of quality to the product. Because once you start writing how to do something with your software, you run into all the ways it's hard to do. And you say, I can't really describe what I should do first. Maybe we should make it simpler. So um, it sometimes it uncovers really huge dramatic gaps in development. In fact, like I've, I've actually had the experience of trying to document something that, uh, that the developers all believe is possible, and then we discover that there's really an entire, <laughs> they have to like program a new app to bridge the gap between the pieces that they have created, because actually no one really thought it all the way through. Um, so it's, it's not uncommon for this kind of thing to happen, and writing procedures really does test quality. You know, if you can't say how to do it, uh, it must be difficult. Um, but let's say it about procedures. They are really repetitive. They are really cluttery. Um, they take up a lot of space in your docs that people have to search through, and they're super boring. Nobody reads procedures to get compelled and empowered and motivated to use your product. They only read procedures to uh, figure out how to do a thing that they already want to do. Um, and that means you'd probably be pretty, better be pretty good at figuring out what the things are that your users want to do, um, because uh, if you're not, you're going to have lots more clutter, um, which is a good argument for minimalist documentation, I guess. If you're writing procedures about how to edit a thing, how to copy a thing, how to delete a thing, and so on and so forth, which um, manuals used to do this back when there were more tech writers in the world and people had giant tech writer teams, uh, then you really are creating a lot of extra pages in your manual if you have a manual, which we also mostly don't <laughs> anymore. Um, but you're creating clutter. And you're creating clutter regardless because a, um, a lot of procedures have repeated steps, right? I mean, you probably, if you have an admin console, you're telling people how to open the admin console in many, many places in your documentation. And that's repetitive and cluttery, and there's not really very much way around it. Um, even if you reuse that content by um, inserting it from data XML or something, you still have it there in your docs a million times. So people are going to find it when they sort, search. It's hard to organize this stuff. It's hard to find stuff in a big cluttery procedure. Um, and the, I think the hardest thing about procedures is directing people to what really the key takeaway is in your procedure, because sometimes that's step seven out of 14 steps, the really key information in the procedure. That's hard to, that's hard to signal, um, and it's hard to take your conceptual information, which is very important because often there's conceptual background to a procedure. You have a lot of, you have a challenge in front of you to figure out whether it goes in the procedure or whether it goes somewhere else with links. Um, I, it's, a, it's an organizational challenge. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the person who gave the, the uh, scenario-based documentation talk, but he had some really good... Hi. <laughs> it's, uh, I remember your last name, but not your first name. Um, anyway, you, did, you illustrated really well how challenging that is and how it's really a, it's really a balancing act to make sure that people can navigate um, all those things. Um, and sales is bored by this kind of thing, they don't care. Uh, finally, we've got tutorial. And let's see if I can make this work. Uh, there's nothing super fancy about this, but um, it's interesting, we actually had some terminology questions about what is a tutorial, um, because during that same talk, um, you said a tutorial is for beginners, and I thought a tutorial is anything that takes you through a that takes you through a process of teaching and then, and then lets you know whether you've succeeded in learning the stuff. I think of tutorial as really hands-on 
learning. It answers questions like, can you walk me through this? Um, what would an example work out, a fully worked out example of this look like? Can I try it myself? How will I know when I fully grasp that, that information? And often, um, this is not rendering very well, is it? Um, often it includes conceptual information, but do you see it's walking you through the actual steps that you need to do and the code snippets you need. Um, and when you come to the end of a tutorial, you actually have done a thing and you have a product, um, which is different from it. And that's what makes it different from a procedure, I think, that it's really, it's really um, whether you, you know that you've done it right you have the, because you have the thing in hand. And now let's see if I can actually alt tab back to my presentation like I'm hoping to. Um, and tutorials are great because they are customized to a really specific use case. Um, like we've said before, they really can, they, if they're done well, they, they really take something that a person would really want to do and then they help you do it. Um, users can do well learning and there's that certain kind of user that really only is happy with hands-on learning and, and being immersed. Um, that kind of user is really tutorials are the very best thing for that. Developers love them a lot. Um, it's empowering and motivating and all the things that procedures and field descriptions and feature lists are not. It helps you, makes you feel like, hey, I can really do something with this and it puts those concepts we've described into action. Um, and the downside is it's really expensive to write and to maintain. So you're committing a lot of resources to get a writer to do someone who writes very well to be immersed enough in the business case and the technical background to actually really create a solid tutorial. It takes a lot of time to get it right. It takes testing of the, with the audience and really actual deep knowledge. So that's not cheap. You can't just take, you, you, you know, you can't take a, an intern from a tech writing program and say, okay, write all my tutorials for me. You have a week to learn the product, not working. Um, they enforce sequential learning in a way. A, a tutorial tells you what order you have to learn things in. Um, and it requires a lot of commitment to you because you have to follow it through the whole course of, of um, what is being taught or you might as well not bother. Um, so you have to either inspire or compel that kind of commitment. So you have to be there you have to be inspirational or you have to flog people through it. I don't know how you make people do tutorials. I presume there are times when that is possible in life. Um, another thing is it's very keyed to what people's learning style is. Um, and I'm one of those people who will not watch a video. Maybe I'll watch a 20 second video. I really don't like watching videos. I don't like having my attention forced in one narrative direction for a long time. Then, and I can't skim a video, so I'm not gonna watch it. So, uh, for me, video tutorials are terrible um, and useless. But for other people, they're incredibly compelling. It just depends. Um, so anyone who is not interested in that use case or the direction or the example um, or who doesn't like the format, um, tutorials are going to be completely lost on them. Anyway, so now that we've done all this breaking down of uh, information styles, information designs, where to put information, what kinds of information we have, who likes them, who doesn't like them, um, what can we do with that information. Um, I'm only going to be mildly constructive here, but <laughs> we are going to say all information has an audience and it's good to remember that and we've just demonstrated that the, custom the customer is not a simple unitary thing. Most of us in a larger organization are not going to be communicating directly with specific customers. We can, we can communicate with customers and get what certain customers need. But another big part of our audience is people around our company who communicate with the customer in different ways and in different modes and have different uses for the information. So, um, so every form of information has an implied audience behind it. And we've just talked about what different kinds of information have different implied audiences. Whoa. Okay, and I'm going over time, which I didn't realize. Uh, information experiences need design. Figure out what they should look like. Figure out where they should go. Um, 
And when you get really big, information starts competing with information. So this slide just shows how you can have a gazillion different kinds of information. Um, and at a certain point, where do you put it all? How do you know which kind you have? Um, and that's another form of design conundrum that you're going to have to deal with when you start scaling up. Uh, you, need, you need to think about addressing the user where the, at the point of need. Um, and remember that the point of need is different for a, somebody who's talking to professional services than it is for somebody who's finding your docs on the website. And again, it's different for somebody who's interacting with support. So find out what those points of need are. There is more than one. Um, and, and uh, think about how your documentation will address those. Um, and finally, information solutions that are, gonna, are, are going to need to be cross-organizational. Um, as that happens, you're going to need resources to maintain them. You'll start seeing information coming from all over your company. Some of it will contradict your information. You're going to need to collaborate with all those other groups around your company um, to make sure that you guys are all on the same page. If you want users to make up, you make, to use your information and not make up their own, um, maybe somebody's going to take your information, paste it into a Word doc, make it into a PDF, store it on their desktop, and hand it out to customers for the next two years after it's updated. You don't want that to happen. Uh, so you need to engage with those other groups. Um, and here are some very, here are some questions that are pragmatic to go on with. I'm just going to leave them on the screen. Um, but these are nice cynical questions um, about how all this applies to your bottom line. Because ultimately, um, Addressing all those needs around the company is what makes you relevant. It what gets, it's what gets people to collaborate with you. It's what pe gets people to buy into you as an information source. Um, and it, and uh, it's what causes people to let you hire more writers if you need them. Stop. <laughs> but thank you very much. I will be here to answer questions.